The following is a presentation of FNX Network, fnx.network. On this episode of Casual Mode, we're going to discuss an interesting Highlander headcanon that fixes the movie series. There's possibly a Friday Nights at Freddy's movie coming out. We're going to discuss that. The final results for the Casual Mode bracket breakdown extravaganza. And as always, silly news and dumb tweets. It's episode 9 of Casual Mode, and it starts now. So get ready, y'all. It's Casual Mode with Jeremy and David. Episode 9 for April 13, 2015. Sleep Mode Sperm. Hello everyone and welcome to Casual Mode, the podcast for geeks of all trades and masters of none. I am your host, the Shadowbird, Jeremy. With me as always is my little brother, my tag team partner, my best friend, David. Happy National Siblings Day, David. What the fuck is that? As of the day of this recording, the uh, appointed special day for today is National Siblings Day. And since you are my little brother, if not by blood, certainly by spirit, I wanted to wish you a happy National Siblings Day. Happy National Siblings Day to you too, Jeremy. And yeah, that's... Huh. Yeah, yeah. When is International Hot Dog Day coming? I want that. I want to be a part uh, of that. I believe that's in July, actually. <laughs> and, and in fact, oh. uh, I forget if if it's that that's on the twelfth, which is my birthday, or if it's National Ice Cream Day. I would much prefer it to be National Ice Cream Day because while I like hot dogs, I like ice cream more. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll have to try a turkey dog because of my condition, but yeah, that's beside the point. We've got a lot of fun stuff on the show for you today. Uh, of course, we're going to talk video games, the new releases, uh, the possibility of there being a Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Uh, we've, in sports section, we're going to be giving you the final results from the casual mode bracket breakdown extravaganza, and of course, the winners from the two uh, NCAA tournaments. And we've got a special surprise for you for the oldest established permanent floating segment. But before we get into all that, I want to take some time right off the front of the show to tell you about this wonderful headcanon that a friend of mine on Twitter made. Uh, her handle is uh, Sailor Gallifrey. Uh, Sailor spelled S-A-I-L-R, no O, and then an underscore between Sailor and Gallifrey. Uh, she is a friend of mine, regular from the uh, Radio Dead Air. Uh, her significant other, Derek the Bard, is also a regular on Radio The Dead Air. In fact, his videos tend to get featured a lot on there. Uh, and uh, I know, David, you have not watched any of the Highlander movies or the series. Nope. So, for those of you who haven't watched uh, this particular franchise, I'm going to give you kind of a brief overview of what it's about. Imagine, if you will, a world in where, which uh, there are people who live perfectly ordinary lives. You know, they grow up, they age, up until the point that they suffer a tragic death. At which point, they wake up and find that they are immortal. From then on, their life changes. They are ageless and they live basically forever with a few possible exceptions. So they have to try and kind of integrate their way into society over the period of centuries, and in a few cases, millennia. And, you know, basically kind of hide in the shadows, not making a big deal of themselves, while also either seeking out or hiding from their fellow immortals who are seeking to take their heads and their power, which is the only way that you can kill these particular immortals in sword fights. They cannot fight on holy ground as a matter of tradition. And uh, whenever their head is taken, it's an explosion of energy, basically, that surges into whomever has taken the head. And in the end, there can be only one. And that one takes a prize which has 
many different possible definitions, but it generally takes the form of ultimate knowledge to be able to help humanity at large. That is the nature of the Highlander movies. However, uh, the second one kind of made a little twist to this. The uh, second movie, Highlander The Quickening, said that uh, the reason why these people are immortal is because they're aliens from a planet called Zeist. And fans went apeshit. Not out of coolness, but because they were like, what? <laughs> so basically what you're trying to tell me is on the second movie, they just took the entire plot of the first movie and took a dump on it. Pretty much, yes. And, and, and the quick Sounds thing, which is supposed to be basically their spiritual essence, kind of turned into the force. <sighs> Regardless, despite this movie, the series has had a longevity. As I kind of mentioned earlier, there is a whole series that went something like seven seasons uh, based on it. Uh, there has been five movies, well, unless you choose to discount the source as a movie, which some of us do, in which case there are only four movies. Some even go even farther than that, discount number two, and Endgame, which means there's basically only two Highlander movies, uh, the original and Final Dimension. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, there is actually an alternate cut of Highlander 2 that uh, does try to fix this by making them post-apocalyptic humans who have gone back in time. Better, but not by much. Uh, well, at least they're humans. Yeah. But since this is a series with so much of a fantastical nature to it, kind of a modern fantasy, for lack of a better phrase, uh, my friend has decided to take that notion and make a new headcanon that fixes the backstory of Highlander from Highlander 2 into something far more interesting and I've actually got it, it storified up uh, with the uh, Storify, uh, Storify.com service. I'll have the link to that in the show notes. Uh, but I am going to go ahead and read these tweets for you. Uh, she first started to say, this is back on April 4th that she uh, wrote this out. First thing, uh, rough paraphrase, do away with the alien shit and maybe go with a f changeling or fairy related flavor. Uh, Stay with me on this. Okay. Now, the main character of the first High of the uh, Highlander movies, uh, the main characters of the Highlander movies and the Highlander TV series are originally Scottish, and in Scotland and Ireland, and of course all around the British Isles, they're soaked in all this mythology about the fair folk, you know, fae, changeling. Here's why she thinks this would work, and I tend to agree with her. For one thing, there are similar beings to fairies in multiple different cultures, just as there are multiple different culture backgrounds for immortals. You know, there are Chinese immortals, there are Egyptian immortals, there are American immortals, there's immortals from all over the world in all times. Hell, the oldest known immortal is, I think... Greek, uh, by the name of Mythos, who at the time of Highlander the series was 3,000 years old. Uh, moving on into even more, uh, here's the actual idea itself. Highlanders are in fact changelings, fey people. They retain some of the noted powers of the fey, like being able to sense others of their kind. The purpose of the gathering is basically a blood sport, a good hunt, a competition, because fairy courts enjoy that kind of thing. You know, they they enjoy sport because they're trickster people. And the prize itself, uh, of course, being the ethereal 
otherworldly knowledge, such as omniscience. To this point, I added in uh, the fact that immortals seem to be relatively easy to be had, at least relative to humans, with a sword of various different kinds. You know, you've got people wielding Zweihanders, which of course would do it. You've got people wielding katanas, which are not really used for that kind of <laughs> effect. Uh, but also people using swords like rapiers that can manage to behead people. The reason for this being is that fey people are notoriously weak to iron. And in fact, if you look at most of the series, with the exception of uh, the longer immortals like Mythos, most of them are from the age of iron and forward. You know, so swords made out of iron or iron alloys, of course they're going to take off the heads of someone who's related to uh, fairy people or changelings because they have a weakness to iron. Well, that explains a lot about the fairy steel relation in Pokemon exactly. as well. Uh, as for the... A thing that I mentioned earlier about immortals do not fight on holy ground. Uh, in the original movie, Ramirez says it's tradition, but in the series and later, you can actually cause bad things to happen if you fight on holy ground. Uh, extending out the fairy mythos is that in some versions of the myth, fairies are actually sort of somewhere between angels and demons. They are fallen from heaven, but they didn't go traitor with Lucifer. So they're kind of skittish around anything related to uh, heaven or God's, you know, the ethereal ultimate good, because they left that. They're not really evil, but they're not really looked down. They're not really looked down upon very well by the forces of good. Of course, they're not looked down pretty well by the forces of evil either. And if you take that into extension, it also explains why there are different immortals personality-wise. Uh, fairy were never really known in mythology for being good or evil. They're always kind of floating somewhere in between. Uh, for instance, taking the D&D &D alignments into effect. You know, you have... Angels, lawful good. You have demons, some of them lawful evil, but a lot of them more on the chaotic evil side. Fey people, true neutral to chaotic neutral. You know, they can do good things for people. They can do bad things for people. It really depends on how they feel on any particular day and what kind of rules they're operating under. To that end, there are immortals who act on the good end, and there are immortals who act on the bad end, and taking an element from the TV series, there is, are these things called light and dark quickenings, which is basically, and there are noted incidences of both in the TV show canon. If someone who has done a lot of evil things takes the head of an immortal who has been known for being ve a very, very good person, have a very good soul in them, it can create kind of a conversion experience. There was one immortal in the TV series known as Darius, who was this real big, brutal conqueror who one day took the head of a religiously devout immortal, had a total conversion, and became a monk. On the other hand, people who are very well known as good, in fact, one incident in the series was uh, the main character, Duncan McLeod himself, took the head of an immortal who was very, very, very evil, who had a dark quickening in him, and ultimately had to fight off that evil influence within himself because that dark quickening took him over and basically heel turned him. So, see, that's why I was saying, stay with me. If you add up all the pieces, this makes a hell of a lot more sense than Ermagad Erlians. <laughs> Anything would have beaten aliens, honestly. And it even, 
And while humans from the distant future does kind of work better, this still beats the pants off of that as well. Because, again, it really ups that vibe of, instead of it being science fiction, more modern fantasy. So, shout out to my friend Sailor Gallifrey. You've come up with a hell of a headcanon. I wish this was the true canon. And in fact, in my mind, every time I watch something Highlander-related forward, with the exception of the second movie, because that's probably not one I'm going to ever watch again, this is going to be the mindset I watch this stuff in now. Well, uh, I guess I'll try to... If one, you know, next time I find it anywhere sort of a series or elsewhere, I'll probably try it. I'll, yeah. I'll give it a uh, The entire... Sorry, I've been very... Sorry, I've been very yeah. nervous today. I've just been out. I'm tired, guys. Yeah, Shit. the entire series of Highlander is up on Hulu, by the way. So, for those of you in North America who can get Hulu, uh, it is there. I believe it's also up on Netflix. Uh, people who are not in North America... I'm sorry, but you're going to have to do some digging for yourself, because I didn't really have time to dig that up. <laughs> but wow. uh, anyway, before we get into the show proper, uh, we would like to let you know about all the different ways that you can contact us and uh, get in uh, touch with us, interact with us, leave us comments, tell us what you think you're doing wrong, please do so nicely. And of course, what we're doing right, again, please do so nicely. David, let him have it. All right, you can follow us on Twitter. I am at Zero Sage I am at Shadowbird 712. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash casual mode podcast. Follow us on Tumblr at casual mode podcast.tumblr.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube, search casual mode. Check us out on SoundCloud. And we are now also available on iTunes. And I am not going to read that long ass link there. Just click on the link that I put on the description there. And apparently, uh, we were labeled explicit on iTunes because apparently we have an excessive use of the F word. Well, <laughs> fuck. What the fuck am I going to do about this, Jeremy? I mean, fuck. It's fucking ridiculous. Well, see, when I put it, when I submitted it to iTunes, one of the things that they said on that is, even if your podcast isn't necessarily explicit, you might want to go ahead and mark it as being so so that if for some reason explicit content is found in your podcast that you forgot was there it doesn't get bumped out because you're lying about the nature of your content and since we do say the fuck word quite a bit i fucking put that shit on there right put that <laughs> i fucking put that shit on there <laughs> well fuck me but yeah uh, soundcloud.com slash casual mode is our link there and like I said you can search us uh, casual mode on your iTunes store or we've got the link in the show notes alright let's get this show rolling it's time to talk video games As always, we start off the video game segment with what we're playing. David, please start us off. Alrighty, um, I've been playing Dragon Ball Xenoverse, and strangely enough, I've been kind of getting into a lot of idle games since I don't really have much time. Uh, Doge Miner, uh, that's dogeminer.se, it's an incomplete simulation game that's supposed to simulate Dogecoin mining. Uh, and the other one being Progress Quest, which... I kind of had to dig up from my uh, really old computer. And that's like a text-only game with like a whole bunch of stats, and you literally do not do anything. You just let the game run itself. <laughs> wow. Seriously. That's, it's called Progress Quest. It's an idle game. It's one of those idle games, so you just let it run. Well, yeah. Progress Quest. What, what is it? Is, is it basically a game where you watch Windows progress bars? Because I used to play that all the time myself. Prince. It was called when I was working as a computer tech. <laughs> yeah. But this one has like HP and strength and stats. and. I don't know. I, felt, I um, often felt a lot of my health being drained away the, 
with how boring those progress bars tended to be. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, at the same time, it's it's also, you know, it's, it's one of those games where you literally just let it run in the background. I mean, I, I, I went to sleep, I woke up, and I was like level 14, so. Uh, I've got a lot of games to talk about this time. Uh, of course, I'm playing Pokemon Shuffle, uh, a little Shin Megami Tensei, Fire Emblem Awakening, uh, uh, because of uh, Club Nintendo's closing, they have released the uh, uh, gold and platinum uh, rewards already. Uh, I used the last of my coins to get uh, Metroid 2 for my 3DS. And I also, as my uh, gold level reward, got Metroid Fusion on my Wii U. So I've been playing a little bit of this. Very nice. Uh, okay. I have been playing Pokemon Shuffle, continuing to play that. I also downloaded Pokemon Rumble World, which is uh, free to play out there now. Uh, is Oh, shoot, i got to yeah, download it's, that. It's really fun. Uh, yeah, it's, okay. it's just basically kind of, for lack of a better phrase, a Pokemon beat-em-up. <laughs> it, it, it's really fun. You get to collect uh, Pokemon toys of various different powers. You can do uh, a daily special quest from from the king, uh, which usually requires you having a, power, a Pokemon of a certain power level to be able to complete them. And, uh, yeah, you can just go take your balloons off to different locations using Pokediamonds to uh, buy them. Of course, we talked about it a lot more in depth uh, last week when we did the Nintendo Direct review because there was news about that there uh it's it's actually really fun i have not yet been compelled to buy any pokemon diamonds because especially when you do the king's quest you can earn pokemon diamonds fairly easily uh i'm right now i'm trying to save up my pokemon diamonds so that i can uh use buy one of either the uh, ruby or sapphire balloon so that I can uh, trek down uh, Kyogre or Groudon. I'm probably going to go for Kyogre first, just because I like Kyogre more. Uh, the big thing, though, that I've been playing this week, Star Trek Online. You like yes, it? Yes, I do. Uh, I got into it because uh, they recently released an expansion called Delta Rising, which... Uh, Brings elements from the TV show Voyager, some of the better elements from the TV show Voyager, it should be noted. And also, uh, because they started this new event, new characters actually get special bonuses for being loan, known as Delta Recruits. Which, if you're already playing Star Trek Online, mm. you can create a new character and get those bonuses. Uh... I kind of feel at least compelled uh, to play it until my character makes Admiral rank, mostly because if I don't, I feel like I won't be fulfilling the storyline stable time loop. Uh, there is time travel involved in here, and it involves uh, an alien threat known as the Iconians, which are a very, very, very ancient race that uh, used to rule the most part of the galaxy way, way, way back in the... Uh, past of the Star Trek universe, like several millennia, and uh, they have come back, and they've got certain races that are basically doing their dirty work for them to try and get a foothold from the Delta Quadrant into the uh, Alpha and Beta Quadrants, where most of Star Trek tends to take place, and also the Gamma Quadrant. So, it's a pretty interesting storyline. Uh, my character is. Uh, Currently a lieutenant commander. Her name is Allison Bella Ray Olson, or at Alba Rayo for short, because I named her after my D&D character. And she is commanding officer of the USS Dark Star, uh, NCC 93738A. I say 93738A. Because that's actually the second Dark Star that I'm using right now. Uh, of course, the uh, first one ended up uh, being retired once I got a new ship when I made Lieutenant Commander. So, ah. yeah. so yeah, I've been having a lot of fun. 
Uh, not only do you get to participate in space battles, which honestly I think are really the most fun part of the game for me so far, but there are also uh, away team missions where you can take uh, members of your bridge crew with you, uh, equip them for battle, and take on the likes of uh, classic series uh, nemesis like the Gorn. Uh, you can take on Orion uh, pirates. You can take on Klingons and other various different races in order to basically try and uh, keep uh, peace in the galaxy. You can either play as a Federation officer, which I did, uh, a member of the Klingons, the Klingon Empire, or a Romulan. Uh, and actually you can make your character various different races within either the Federation or the Klingon Empire and their allies, or the Romulan Empire and their allies. Because when it started off, this uh, this game started off, they was actually they were basically kind of like, uh, for lack of a better phrase, the uh, Alliance and the Horde from uh, World of Warcraft, where they were all separate competing factions, uh, trying to basically get a foothold. War had broken out yet once again in the uh, Star Trek universe, and you could get into one of those and there are still some conflicts between those factions in uh the delta rising uh expansion but it's mostly more focused on some of these groups are trying to cooperate a little more to fight the iconian threat and all other threats from the delta quadrant including the borg yeah mm. uh all this is a prelude to uh, the upcoming season that uh, has not yet released. I'm not certain, entirely certain when it's going to release. But uh, they are up to season 10 in this game now. And that is going to be releasing very soon. Like I said, if you want to get in on Star Trek Online right now, uh, you can become a Delta recruit, get uh, bonuses to experience and the like, and really level up your character pretty fast. Within about the space of a week, I went from cadet to lieutenant commander. And that's only playing like about maybe a few hours for about four or five days. So, pretty fast level uh, build up with the boost from being a Delta recruit. Uh, I am also a part of a fleet on the Federation side. Uh, Related to the Grindstone community, uh, Chaos D1's MMO Grinder, his uh, forums. Uh, the fleet on the Federation side is uh, Elysian Spirits. So, uh, I believe there's also, they may have also the Grindstone fleet on the Klingon side. I have no idea if there's one on the Romulan side uh, just yet. But, uh, yeah, that's what I've been playing this week. That's what I've been playing the most of this week, honestly. Uh, new releases for the week. Uh, the two noted ones, notable ones, are releasing uh, April the 10th, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3D, the new 3DS port of the uh, Wii U rarer game. Much more wider spread this time, not a GameStop exclusive, thank God. Uh, of course, it's only available on the new 3DS. If you have a current generation 3DS, uh, unfortunately, it will not run on that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it, it is optimized for the newer hardware. Uh, if you are so inclined uh, to play these kind of games, which I'm not, Grand Theft Auto V has released on PC on the 14th, or will release on the 14th. Also releasing on the 14th for Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC, the 10th game of the Mortal Kombat main series, also known as Mortal Kombat X. And if I remember correctly... It, uh, Mortal Kombat 9 had one of their DLC characters be Freddy Krueger. This one is going to have a DLC character of Jason Voorhees. So pretty much coming yeah. full circle. <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the line they also brought back Freddy as a DLC character just so you can have Freddy vs. Chase in Mortal Kombat style. Whoever wins, ah. Outworld loses. Mm. Right. We should also note uh, lesser uh, uh, release. 
but it is one that I've seen played around quite a bit because it's just such a quirky little game. As of April 9th, I Am Bread is available on PC. It is a game. It is a game where you play as a piece of bread whose goal is to become a delicious piece of toast. Oh shit! I gotta play that game. And it, 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 its controls <laughs> it are like there fun. are different buttons to control each of the corners of the bread, and you have to climb around stuff and find ways to toast yourself into perfect toastiness. Which is a phrase I never thought I would ever say in related to a video game. Find ways to toast yourself into perfect toastiness. <laughs> Where do people come up with this stuff? I swear. Independent games, man. They come up with all kinds of interesting shit. I mean, I mean, I gotta make an independent game. I gotta make I mean, something I mean, up. Remember the game like, World seriously. of Goo, where your where your goal was just to build the largest tower of goop possible. I did not know that one. I'm not. A, I don't. I don't keep track of independent games too much, but shit, I gotta make a game now. Shoot, I'm, I'm being I'm being shown up here. Craziness. Yeah, think yeah. up something. And, I was watching this one game late, earlier called uh, uh, Super Wolfenstein HD, which will probably go into my uh, stuff I'm playing for next week because I just downloaded it uh, last night and I haven't opened it yet. I was gonna open it after the show. And I saw a uh, video that Markiplier did for it, and I was like, I gotta play this. Because it's like the funniest thing. Think Wolfenstein completely cartoonized, and like instead of the soldiers and dogs dying, they're just kind of bouncing <laughs> around. Like, like the bullets just cause them for most of the time to bounce and it's very difficult to kill them <laughs> it's hilarious they, they just kind of bounce around and the only way that you can take them out is that you gotta just drag them into like the walls or something the walls are like this bottomless pit <laughs> oh, <laughs> there. Wow. I, I'm playing it I am playing it and I'll tell you how I like it and yeah it's pretty good and then another and a couple more I want to check out is Handless Millionaire um yeah, that game is about a uh, um, you're trying to reach a bunch of money through a guillotine, and if you don't tie it right, chops off your hand. You get two chances for two hands. <laughs> oh wow! Like seriously, there are some really fucked yeah. up games. Speaking of fucked up independent games, uh, you've probably heard already heard the news by now, but now you're going to get our take on it because uh, David uh, has been a fan of uh, this particular game series. Apparently, there is a Five Nights at Freddy's movie in the works. Uh, from the Whoa. from the Hollywood Reporter, uh, Warner Brothers has picked up the rights to Five Nights at Freddy's, the popular video game series created by Scott Cawthorn. The feature adaptation will be produced by Roy Lee of Vertigo Entertainment, as well as Seth Graham Smith and David Katzenberg of Cat Smith Productions. The game takes place in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a darker version of Chuck E. Cheese, where an animatronic animal band performs kitty songs by day and goes on murderous rampages by night. The goal of the game is to survive a night locked inside, knowing that a furry death machine might jump out of the dark at any moment. Said Graham Smith, quote, We're looking forward to working with Scott to make an insane, terrifying, and weirdly adorable movie. Which is a phrase I never thought I'd ever hear said. Uh... <laughs> The story lends itself, really lends itself to being a movie, and it taps it into a largely unexplored niche of horror that a lot of people will be able to relate to, said Cawthorn. The, proje the project is currently out to writers, trying to find writers for it. Uh, executive producers will be Adam Stone and Jay Ireland, and John Berg and Nick McEncurve, I probably mispronounced that name, are overseeing it for Warners. Uh, for the uh, sake of uh, uh, just getting an idea of what some of these people have worked on. Uh, Roy Lee also was a producer on the uh, Liam Neeson action thriller Run All Night. And also has the Poltergeist remake due out to open on May 22nd of this year. As for uh, Graham Smith and Katzenberg, they're currently also developing a Beetlejuice sequel. 
I think that the only, the last time I had ever heard the description of insane, terrifying, and weirdly adorable was used to describe the WWE tag team Slater Gator with oh. one <laughs> What? I'm serious. Oh wow, dude! <laughs> I'm actually serious on that one. I'm not. I'm not making a joke. Yeah, you know, I can understand people who make independent games want to get the most money out of their stuff as they can. I mean, I mean, just look at how how chilled out. Uh, that uh, Angry Birds was. I mean, we had Angry Birds Rio, Angry Birds Star Wars, all these various different versions of movie-themed Angry Birds that came out. Then Angry Birds came out with a kart racer, which supposedly has outsold Mario Kart, although, let's be fair, it's probably not anywhere near as fun as Mario Kart, especially now that 200cc is coming out. This could be a this could be a really big hit. I'll be honest with you. The one thing I'm afraid of is that five six years from now we're gonna get sick of it and we're gonna you know say on casual mode coming out now Five Nights at Freddy's Seven, Freddy in Space, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I'm serious. It, it's gonna be like yeah. yeah. And also along the same lines, let's face it, Angry Birds itself has been played out by now. As evidenced by the fact that apparently there was a TV series about it, which I didn't find out until I saw the DVDs in the store. Yeah. By the way, under the must reads, they're talking about that uh, about the uh, status of Fast and the Furious Eight. I don't think I don't think there's going so, to be a Fast yes. and the Furious Eight because let let's face it, I with with Paul Walker uh, bereft of life, I don't think there's. Yeah, but I'm I'm just trying to say is that that should explain I mean to people that if something's a big hit, they're going to milk it out as much as they can. And to be fair, from what I have heard about Fast about Furious Seven, it's really good. I've not gotten to see it myself, but everything it's, I've heard about Furious Seven says pretty damn good. This is the one movie without Paul Walker. Uh, well, it's the last one with Paul Walker. Okay. Yeah. Fur- Furious Seven is the last is the last last one with Paul Walker, the the one that they were shooting during his unfortunate passing. Right, and they had his uh, brother finish yeah. up for him. All right. Okay. Uh, looks like we've got some uh, Major League Pokemon results for you, David. If you would share those, please. Yep, the results of ML Pokemon Six. My karma ran over my Slugma. It is uh well first off we had uh the start of two um Elite Four series. For those of you not in the know about the rules for Major League Pokemon, once someone has attained eight badges, they start something we call the Elite Four series. Now you may have heard of the Elite Four in the Pokemon games. This is a little different. Um they're put into the combatant is put into a series of seven Pokemon matches, and it is essentially a best of seven series against the Elite Four. Once they have defeated an Elite Four character, that Elite Four character can no longer battle in the series. So, that being said, we have two people right now currently in the Elite Four series. Dylan Maldonado, uh, who faced Patrick Ilg in Game 1 of his Elite Four series on, I want to say, Tuesday night. Yeah, it's Tuesday night. And uh, he had lost... Uh, the score being a 6-2 loss to Patrick Ilk, so he trails 1-0. Also in the second match, um, the Elite Four Series, Wayne Trimnell begins his Elite Four Series match against David Walker, in which it wasn't a complete bloodbath, but Wayne Trimnell managed to annihilate David Walker 6-2 to go up 1-0 in his Best of Seven Elite Four Series. And finally, in the main event... We had the Major League Pokemon champion, future just Zircon region champion, Alex Carbo, taking on the challenger, Dylan Marin, the winner of the Joker's Wild Tournament. And in the best of three, it turns out that Alex Carbo proved too much in the end. Dylan Marin fought valiantly, but Alex Carbo did win this one. 
Final score, 6-2, 6-3, to retain the Major League Pokemon Championship. And that was the result of ML Pokemon 6, My Karma Ran Over My Slugma. So, uh, have you decided on what the name for the next event is going to be? Yes, Ditto Express. It's everything you want it to be. <laughs> yeah. No. I think I decided on that one back in the yeah. Let's Play I did. Uh it's just wonderful how many puns you can make uh, off of these uh, Pokemon names, I swear. In fact, a lot of the Pokemon names are puns themselves. Uh, with rare, rare yeah. exception, uh, some of the uh, yeah, some of the legendaries have more esoteric names to them. But uh, for the most part, there's a lot of puns in Pokemon names. Yeah, pretty much. Coughing, wheezing. Yeah. Or, or yes, as we I... thought it was pronounced way back in the day, listen, watching the anime, coffee! Oh, coffee, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he looked like a bag of coffee, didn't he? <laughs> with the poison, with the poison sun symbol and everything. Being sarcastic, guys. Uh, I'm trying to think of some more weird ones for you. If I come up with any, I'll, I'll let you know some more. I, I, I know I already came up with one for the future. Uh, I don't know if we said this on podcast, but... Uh, uh, herbivore, omnivore, carnivore, gardevoir. Yeah, I think I was going to use that one for number eight. I'm not entirely sure yet, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, I, oh I've, I've got one kind of related. Getting Galaid. Okay. What is it again? Getting Galaid. <laughs> Kind of oh, a little what? bit, kind of a little bit more of a blue uh, pun. But, uh, <laughs> you can have those two back to back because you know, <laughs> Rawls Rawl's evolutions. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the sports section. Let's let's talk a little round ball, among other things. <laughs> Talking sports now, and we'd like to start you off by letting you know that, of course, the uh, bracket breakdown extravaganza has ended for 2015. And in the end, winner by points, even though all of our brackets were completely and utterly torn to shreds by the time the final four came around, is David with 760 total points. Woo! Yeah! Uh, I managed to make second place by tiebreaker. Uh, with 690 points uh, alongside my big brother, Robert. Oh, congratulations, Jeremy. You got second place. Yeah. The championship game was Wisconsin versus Duke. And, uh, Ooh! Yes, uh, by now, uh, Mike Krzyzewski has won his fifth NCAA tournament championship, so uh, props to him and uh, their players. Well, going through the Final Four combatants, I mean, they all did a great job, in my opinion, you know. Kentucky, I mean, they had a disappointing season, but they can take comfort in the fact that they did make it to the Final Four, and I think that they're, like, one of the few teams that have gotten 38 wins in a season. Yeah, they are the first team to get to 38 wins in a season, at least on the men's side. Yeah. Michigan State can take comfort knowing they were the only non-one seed in the Final Four. They were a seven seed. And one 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 seven. That's that. That's pretty interesting. And Tom Izzo, freaking genius, man. Yeah. Wisconsin can take uh, comfort in the fact that they defeated Kentucky and they made it to the championship. And at least for the second half, it looked like they were about to win, right? I mean that that has to count for something. Beating Kentucky. Yeah. Although there there was a call there that kind that uh, did bring a little uh, controversy there. Uh, one point where uh, one of the Duke players may have actually touched a basketball before it went out of bounds it was but it was called uh it was called a duke ball then instead of uh wisconsin ball uh, uh but but wisconsin can take comfort in knowing they were the one in 38 and one <laughs> as we can say and duke can go fuck themselves with a cactus yeah in all seriousness though this has been a really really great season for duke 
for a while there they didn't really yeah. look so great but then as is want to do with the Mike Krzyzewski team once they got into the tournament they got on their roll and Mike Krzyzewski's season this season the 2014-2015 uh, college basketball season he couldn't have asked for a more fantastic year I mean he got more wins than anybody ever in college basketball a thousand eighteen and he's probably not going to retire anytime soon so that number is going to rise yeah he's going to go for at least five more seasons and (laughs) in that same year he won his fifth national championship which puts him all alone in second place behind only john wooden and on the women's side gino oriyama wow that is quite amazing. That's off to Coach K. Yeah. Speaking of the women's side, uh, yeah, UConn did win the uh, women's national championship. They played Notre Dame. Uh, condolences, though, to uh, fans of uh, the South Carolina Lady Gamecocks, uh, one of whom, whom was a part of our bracket breakdown extravaganza, Dodger of Zion. Uh, I was rooting for the Lady Gamecocks, too. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, they, like Kentucky, got bounced in the Final Four to Notre Dame. Uh, but uh, UConn uh, had just a completely dominating year. It wasn't a uh, perfect record year, which actually UConn has done multiple times before. But I believe this was the third title in a row for UConn. And as mentioned earlier, it is Gino Oriema's 10th which ties him in college basketball with the legendary John Wooden of UCLA. John Wooden won 10 national championships? Yeah. Wow. Seriously. Yeah. You see it all of them UCLA? I believe so. And Gino Oriema has won them all with UConn, so, you know. Wow. Interesting. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that, you know, as, as many cheap shots as he's taken at the uh, men's college basketball game if Gino Oriema wanted to coach in men's basketball and had basically kind of the same style that he uses with the UConn women I think he would probably have a- at least a comparable amount of success maybe not as many championships but I think he would be just as much of a contender in the men's game as he would in the women's game. I honestly think he's that good of a coach. You think Coach K level? Yeah. I, I honestly, I believe in him as a coach that much. I, I'm not a UConn fan by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I was, yeah. I was rooting for Notre Dame mostly because I'm tired of watching UConn win, honestly. But I well, have to... It also kind of helps that UConn had like three undefeated seasons back like a few years back, and basically their team could double as a WNBA team, so... But yeah, they've had a lot of players come from UConn into the WNBA, which unfortunately doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think, because there are a fantastic amount of great basketball players in the WNBA. And... I was told... Because it just wasn't quite as exciting as the NBA. There weren't as many, there were no dunks, actually. It's a lot more technical basketball than it is showmanship, in a way. Well, I, I'm more the technical sports kind of person anyway, as far as that goes. I mean, it's evidenced by, just look at the list of most of my favorite wrestlers, for instance. And they more end up on the Matt Technician kind of side. Although some of them do also have the more entertaining capability of their own, but that's not. That's not there. Fact, I believe only one female in recent memory has ever actually dunked. Maybe two. I'm not sure. I know one. That that one in Baylor a while back. Yeah. Uh, Brittany Grimer. Yes, Brittany Grimer. Yeah. I think there was one more. I'm not entirely sure. But yeah. WWE NBA doesn't give as much props as I think it probably deserves. But, yeah, I honestly believe if Gino Oriema wanted to, he could coach in the men's game and have pretty a pretty darn good amount of success. Yeah, similar to the likes of Tom Izzo or even Krzyzewski. 
or or Roy Williams or Bill Self or you know any of the top names in the men's game, I believe Gino Oriema could fit right in there. I think that he probably wins as many championships as he does in the women's area because um, there isn't as much parity in women's basketball. I hate to say it as men's basketball. Well, th- th- for the longest time there wasn't, but teams are actually starting to catch up now. Yeah. I, well, uh, well, then again, this is also kind of uh, being paradoxical as well to what I was saying. But um, did you know that actually in the women's tournament there has been a 16 seed that has down to one? I know. I know. So, I mean, you know, I, I guess. But but overall, though, I'm saying that parity is very uh, not quite as prominent in the women's area as there is in the men's. Although this year we did have several teams that went on a very very long stretch i mean how long was were the lady gamecocks undefeated yeah they were, true they, they were undefeated for most of the season most of the regular season and of course they made it to the final four which goes to show that kind of a season wasn't a fluke so right. and, and notre dame this is the second year in a row that uconn has faced notre dame in the women's championship true it's also the second year in the row UConn beat Notre Dame. <laughs> but even so, the fact the fact that you have programs that are starting to get good long runs in there and are starting to get in on a regular basis to the Final Four on the women's side really shows that there are teams that are catching up to UConn. And the fact that UConn is still winning really shows how well that Oriyama is coaching his team. True. All right. Moving on to professional round ball. Uh, the end of NBA regular season is coming to a close. Uh, playoff spots are hotly contested. Uh, there are still three seeds in the East that are wide open. There is only one seed, though, in the West that is wide open, and it is being contested most closely right now between uh, the New Orleans Pelicans, don't laugh, and my Oklahoma City Thunder, who are currently just out of the playoffs. And the fact that Oklahoma City's actually in the hunt for that eighth seed in the Western Conference, A, goes to show how tough of a conference that uh, the Western Conference really is, and B, also goes to show how horrible of luck the Thunder have had this year. You know, well, it couldn't be as nearly horrible a look as uh, the Lakers, has it? Well... The Lakers are almost at the bottom of the Western Conference, so of course it's not that bad. But to get so close and be just out of it is a pretty crappy place to be. And just consider how basically the course of the season went for the Oklahoma City Thunder. At the beginning of the season, Kevin Durant was out of injury. Then Russell Westbrook went out with an injury. Then Serge Ibaka went out. Then Russell... Then Russell Westbrook came back first, and Oklahoma City started to pick up some steam. Then Kevin Durant went back, and of course they started to pick up steam again. But then Russ, but then Kevin Durant went out again, <laughs> and Russell Westbrook basically had to carry the team for the longest part. Kevin Durant came back for a little bit, but then he went out again. <laughs> oh man. And Russell Westbrook has been basically trying to carry the team throughout the playoffs, and he's been doing a pretty good job of it. He's had this long, long stretch where he had tri- where he was hitting triple double after triple double after triple double, and it finally ended against the Spurs just this past week, uh, who are finally starting to hit their playoff stride. And. Unfortunately, while Westbrook is a really great player, he just I, I he can't quite carry it by himself, and I fear for the Thunder in Oklahoma City right now, because for one thing, there's been this shadow of talk about uh, Oklahoma City of uh, as Kevin Durant's contract is coming up. There's been a lot of talk of, oh, is he going to leave? Might he go to Washington, D.C., where he's originally from? Uh, which, honestly, I hope doesn't happen, because if he does, there's one restaurant in Bricktown that's def- going to have to go an awkward name change. Uh, <laughs> huh. 
but uh, yeah, it, yeah, there there's been that. Uh, the Oklahomans really been kind of laying into the Thunder to an inordinate degree, uh, which uh, which I would like to say, fuck you, Oklahoman, for that. Uh, th- fuck you, Oklahoma and sports reporters, because, uh, you know, ever since they came over from Seattle, this team has worked its ass off. And and it went through a slow progress. It went through a pretty, actually a pretty quick progression where they started from, like, lower end of the playoff, uh, you know, just getting through, like, the first round to within, like, about three or four years they were ending up in the finals and then last year they got all the way to the western conference finals and lost to eventual champion spurs if i remember correctly and this year they may miss the playoffs all together and it's like as soon as that's happening the people of oklahoma are just like throwing all of this shit at the Thunder, and I don't think it's deserved. It's it, it's very much a what have you done for me lately kind of mentality. Which is kind of funny considering that the Thunder used to be a body bag game not too long ago for many NBA teams. Yeah, and you know, it, unfortunately with some fandoms, it, it really happens this way where you've got, things are going well, the bandwagon is wide open. And really where this started to slide was when Oklahoma City traded away James Harden, which, by the way, big mistake, I think. I mean, just look at how he's doing in Houston. He's been an MVP candidate for the Rockets, who are the number two seed in the West. And, in fact, probably, well, right now, they're the number three seed in the West, actually. There's six in the West, currently. I just took a look. The Rockets? The Rockets have dropped to six, yeah. At the current standing, they're currently the sixth seed. They will be, uh, they would, as of today, be playing the San Antonio Spurs, who are now half a game ahead of them. Yeah, yeah. Pelicans and Thunder, Thunder are still. They have the exact same record. Both of them won tonight, so uh, Thunder didn't hop back in. But that that's like the tightest race, right there. Yeah, the Rockets have been floating around those high seeds, uh, very much. Honestly, the only reason why they dropped down right there is because the Spurs are getting back into playoff form. But and Harden's been an MVP candidate for them. It's like, you know, to some degree, I understand why they traded him away because basically they had kind of three competing interests there with Durant, Westbrook, and Harden. And so they had to, you know kind of normalize that somewhat by trading away one and they aren't going to get rid of Durant or Westbrook because they're by far the big stars uh MVP for Kevin Durant and for the longest time Westbrook was actually being considered a MVP candidate in his own right uh but right now it looks actually looks like the runaway MVP candidate mostly because his team is running away with the Western Conference Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors, who, as we established from a sign in WrestleMania, is apparently a Paul Heyman guy. And you sure acting like one, too, apparently. They are the one seed in the West. And the winner of the Pelicans and Thunder, a little battle that you two teams are doing right now, will probably be fed to the Warriors in the, ra- in the first round. Actually, yeah. will definitely be fed to the Warriors in the first round. So yeah. I'm not quite sure if this is really a position that you guys want to be in. <laughs> Well, see, the thing is, if you're in the playoffs, at least you got something to play for. If you're that ninth seed just out of the playoffs, I mean, you don't have lot. I mean, you're out of. You're pretty much out of getting any balls for the lottery. So good luck with that. Your draft position's not going to be that great either. So oh, it, it's it's kind of yeah. it's kind of a rough place to be. So actually, actually, yeah, the loser would be dead last in the lottery because they would be the higher of the two last seeds, basically. Yeah, because, two nine seeds. Yeah, because uh, the uh, two uh, because the ninth seed in the uh, East right now is the Indiana Pacers, and they are sub five hundred. In fact, yeah. uh, sixth, the sixth, seventh, and eighth seed in the East 
are all below 500 right now. Milwaukee Bucks, Boston Celtics, and Brooklyn Nets in descending order. So it, it would take a miracle for them to get a lot to get uh, a high draft pick with those kind of odds. Uh, so it, I, I I weep for my thunder because it's like it's like the bandwagon. People are jumping off of the bandwagon, and I'm like, what happened to, you know, what happened to us all being gung-ho about the Thunder? Why did that go away, start going away when we traded away Harden? Why did that go away when we lost in the finals to, when we lost in the Western Conference finals to the Spurs? Why did that go away now that we're on the cusp of leaving the, if we're such great fans of the Thunder, why are we not, why are we not desperately trying to feed our energy into the Thunder for this playoff run so that they can even make it as an eight seed and see how far they can go as an eight seed? Why are, why are we throwing all of the shit onto the Thunder this season? Because it didn't work for the Chicago Cubs. You think it worked for you guys? There's a difference between mine between having hope and being just outright delusional. Okay. <laughs> uh, well. Anyway, uh, that that's round ball talk. L- let's talk a little wrestling, shall we? Big news from this past week. I don't remember if we talked about it before, but we are definitely going to talk about it now. AJ Lee has retired from in-ring competition. And Bird is sad. Yeah, it, definitely one of my uh, one of my favorite divas, honestly. Just in yeah. personality-wise and just in ability, she was quite amazing. Yeah. Now, it should be noted that, of course, she is just retiring from in-ring competition. Uh, I don't... I haven't gotten a chance to look up, so I do not know the exact reasons why this has been the case just yet uh but since it is just in ring competition there is a very real possibility that she could end up being still an on screen figure for instance she had a really great run as a general manager on smackdown once upon a time i believe it was so she she's been able to play an on screen authority figure she could transition into being a manager maybe you know what would be really fantastic? Kick Byron Saxton the hell off of the SmackDown commentary crew and put AJ on there. We need a female main commentator. It is now 2015 WWE. Put AJ Lee behind the announcer's table. Make it happen. Be a lot more interesting than Byron Saxton. He made it sound like a, he made Raw turn into like the PGA Tour. I mean, come on. You, 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 and he's about to go for an arm. Bar. Yeah, you've got Michael... Michael Cole out with an in, with an injury in angle. Instead of having Byron Saxton out, up there, either A, throw a bone to Corey Graves, who is doing a great job on commentary down in NXT, or it's 2015. Get us a female commentator. Put AJ Lee there. Heck, you've had former wrestler. You've had had recent, you know, people who have been out for injury or whatever ever wrestlers who've been out with injury being on commentary before you did it with her husband it's vince mcmahon he thinks it's 1965 so it, it come on okay then i'm gonna feed this then to triple h and stephanie mcmahon since they're pretty much the people running the company although vince mcmahon does have final say in many things you know you're wanting to change things in the wwe you're wanting to make it a little more future proof Put her behind the desk. Put AJ behind the desk. I'm just saying. We have not had a regular... I I don't think we've ever had a female commentator except for the occasional, you know, guest spot from wrestlers during feuds and whatever that they have. We have not had a regular female commentator behind the desk, and it is damn well past time. I mean... I mean, heck, I would even, you know, have one on each show. Have AJ maybe on Raw. Put Renee Young on SmackDown. Renee Young's fantastic on the pre-show. And and 
admittedly, maybe the maybe she may not necessarily be able to do the play by play play stuff, but maybe she could pick that up eventually. You know, have her on there maybe as a color commentator, talk about stuff she, maybe she's talked about with wrestlers. You know, in the backstage area during the ring, give us some more interest into the actual wrestling matches itself. I love Renee Young. She's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, AJ behind one, maybe Raw, Renee Young on SmackDown, maybe I'd watch more often. I mean, e even with me having basically just watched like the 90-minute versions of Raw on, on Hulu... I would find that infinitely more entertaining if we had the Black Widow on the mic. True. Uh, this week's, past week's NXT episode uh, was actually, uh, which goes to show you what the uh, recording delay on these episodes is. Uh, yeah, I didn't watch it, by the way, because I already knew how it was going to end up. So. Yeah, it was uh, from uh, WrestleMania Access. We had uh, really the two main, we had two main matches on there which were from the actual tournament that they had during WrestleMania Access for the entrance into the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Uh, Finn Balor faced Neville in one? Or, what, or was it Hideo Itami who faced Neville? I forget which. But the, fin uh, the finals I know for certain was Finn Balor versus Hideo Itami. Former right. tag team partners, so you know they know each other very well. Really, really, really great match that, and so we did actually have the three matches on there. To correct myself from her earlier, and of course Hideo Itami won because he was in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal, and you know you can definitely tell that uh, Finn and Hideo are are such good friends. You know they celebrated together in the ring ring hugged it out in the ring uh you can definitely tell there's friendship there uh also uh during the uh, build-up to wrestlemania they showed little clips from the uh, show that they did in his san jose uh by the way uh hideo itami uh, formerly known in japan as kenta uh, before his signing with uh, wwe actually the innovator of the uh move that cm punk made popular in uh, North America, the GTS. And during the San Jose uh, NXT show, he actually got to uh, wield that out during a match. So, the originator of the GTS Ooh. now has the GTS in his arsenal in WWE. And as soon as it hit, the entire San Jose crowd just went freaking nuts. <laughs> so, you know, he does have that uh, that running, that one uh, running kick as his main finisher. But don't be surprised if, uh, especially once he makes it onto the main show, he's using the GTS more often. Especially because that's already been established, thanks to CM Punk, as being a really, really, uh, really brutal finisher. Yeah. Uh, there is a preview for next week's uh, episode of NXT. Uh, th this wrestling segment next week may very well end up just me going something to the effect of uh, Dana Brooke. Uh, you really like girls who can beat you up, don't you? Uh, and one of my favorite video game heroines is Samus Aran, so. Uh. Jeez. <laughs> so, I I'm looking forward to seeing how she is in the ring, but the. Uh, she, she's been marketing herself on Twitter as the uh, killer Barbie, and uh, she definitely looks the part. So, I, I'm interested. As I've said many times in the past, I am very interested to see her wrestle in the NXT ring, because uh, she will definitely uh, add something to the NXT women's division, and also yeah. and has definitely added a little something to my heart. <laughs> Jeremy oh my god uh, I'm just going to have to drop more F-bombs so iTunes can kick us off <laughs> that was embarrassing I am such a shameless mark I know yes uh, you are 
Uh, the oldest established permanent floating segment of the show is up next, and we've actually got a little bit of a surprise for you for that one. Yay, I wonder what it is. Alright, uh, those of you who were paying attention to the Casual Mode YouTube page uh, noticed that David did a video response of a uh, interesting nature uh, within the last week or so. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that here. So, David, if you would. Yeah. Alright, shortly after uh, putting up uh, the last episode of Casual Mode last week, I, came across, I was about to go eat at uh, Applebee's for my usual... Monday dinner before I head off to work, and I come across this video. Um, uh, don't ask me how I got it. I wasn't really quite sure how, but uh, it was of this uh, YouTuber. His name is Joshua Feuerstein. Feuerstein? Feuerstein? I'm, I'm not 100% sure how do you pronounce it. I think I went with Feuerstein because that's how everyone else was uh, saying it. But if I butcher the name, I really don't give a fuck. Um, the oh, basically what happened was was that he I guess he was trying to make some kind of a point, and so he called up this bakery down in Florida. The bakery is called Cut the Cake Bakery, and uh, he asked them that he wants a cake that says "We don't support gay marriage." Can you do this? And the first thing that she asks is, "Is this a joke?" And I mentioned on my uh, I mentioned on my uh, little rant that I did there that uh, you know you can get away with you know some kind of you know slurs or stuff like that on a cake if it's a prank yeah I mean there are now, some bakeries that will make like you know for like bachelor parties or whatever make cakes in the shape of a penis you know yeah I yeah so I mean so it's not I mean it's not like it's anything new you know I but even then you have to be somewhat lighthearted in in taste um, so first thing that she asks is, is this a joke? And he says, no. And then she says, no, or we don't want to do it. He then hangs up the phone and starts blasting the bakery, um, saying that this is, this shows that we Christians can't, uh, we Christians, uh, are being like taken away from our rights or something like that, because apparently you can't order a cake. That says we don't support gay marriage, and I mention in the YouTube video that much of the reason why uh, he cannot have a cake that says we don't support gay marriage, at least not one that's made uh, by someone else, is the exact same reason why I can't have a cake being made that says fuck the Christians, because they are of an aggressive and provocative manner, and if they're not joking... It's not really, um, yeah, it's not that great of an influence. I, I'm, I'm over the uh, anger that I had back in the rant, I'm over most of it. I'm still pretty pissed off. But, uh, but I talked a little bit with a couple people regarding this. Uh, one guy actually in the discussion talked about, should people be able to refuse service on moral grounds? And Jeremy, you know, you know how, you know that in, this is like one of those questions where, my brain and my knee-jerk reaction go completely different ways. And you know this. Yeah. You know me pretty well. Yeah. My knee-jerk reaction is to say, no, fuck you, Christian, go away. And for those of you who don't know why, I'm going to save that for a future video, hopefully way, way down the road. Um, I don't want to talk about it now. Just know that, yes, I am not very fond of Christians of the born-again conservative type at all. So I, I gave the honest opinion of it. And I and to me, I hate to go political on this show, on, on this particular podcast. Um, it's something that I did for so long. And I don't really like talking about it very much because this is supposed to be a sports and video game podcast. But whenever somebody does something stupid, it has to be said. As is often mentioned, uh, there are many things that we at Casual Mode do not condone. Idiot shaming is not one of them. Okay, and 
Okay, well, when it comes to this particular issue, I'll go a little bit classic mode, I guess you could say, if we're going by Fire Emblem terms on this, and say that I am kind of, when it comes to normal businesses discriminating against gays, absolutely, positively, no, no fucking way that they should be allowed to do that. None. And I am very much against the Indiana law, that's the Religious Freedom Act, which, by the way, they're not modifying that. Just letting you know, they're modifying that to try to get rid of that uh, little loophole. But as far as, but if it comes to things like marriage services, like if you're a Christian marriage service and you're being asked to bake a cake for a gay marriage or a lesbian marriage, should you? And I had to think about this for a second and I had to say that I, I'm not 100% on board with the idea of forcing religious, particular religious, you know, religious companies that are focused directly on the marriage. I'm talking about directly. You know what I'm talking about, Jeremy? Yeah. Like, yeah. Bake the cake, wedding planner, pastor, whatever. People who are directly involved with the said marriage to, uh, to be forced to serve for said people because that would mean a full endorsement of that particular marriage at least probably in their eyes now of course if it was if i were in their shoes i'd do it for the money myself <laughs> but uh or make myself so expensive that they wouldn't want to take me but i mean i can't really f i can't really say that you know that that's right to do so, I don't. I'm not 100 percent on board with Oregon finding that Christian cake company just because they didn't want to bake a cake for a gay marriage. I mean, it is their religion, and I believe we do have religious freedom in America. And if it and if you are direct and if you're being directly involved in something means endorsing it, then I mean, really, you know, that's that's kind of, that's kind of a gray area. However, Joshua Feuerstein was not talking about gray areas. He was basically being a fucking asshole. And he was basically going after a company, just a random company in general, just to try to make a point to please his little god. And I want people to understand the difference here. I'm all for full head-on debate into whether or not certain companies should serve uh, LGBT marriages or not. I'm, I'm well open to them because I'm on the borderline myself if, if a religious company should be directly involved with it if they don't endorse it. Because I certainly would not want to endorse something. You know, I certainly would not want to be forced to serve somebody that I don't endorse. You know what I mean, Jeremy? Yeah, I understand that perfectly. I, yeah. I'm much the same yeah. way. Yeah, so I, so I mean, uh, for example, we're actually, uh, I was talking with Jeremy about this a couple weeks ago. We're going to start a sponsor uh, segment, a short sponsor segment in about two to three weeks. And I already have a couple of things lined up, most of them being of my own doing. Uh, uh, basically stuff, you know, basically just certain stuff that we're going to just put up just to say, hey, look, we have a sponsor section and stuff like that. And there are certain rules in it. Basically, there are a few things that Jeremy and I absolutely, positively will not endorse. Although, if Dollar Shave Club wants to throw some money our way, we are totally up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, but I mean, that's what I'm talking about is that um, for us, you know, if it's in our shoes, would I want Trinity Broadcasting Network sponsoring us? No. Neither would I. No. I absolutely would not. So why should I say the shoe on the other foot, a Christian, uh, a Christian wedding company, be forced to serve in an LGBT wedding if they don't believe in that said marriage? I can't. That's just not, you, you know, that that's not right of me. But in this case, he's talking about the Christians being oppressed. And, oh my god, how long have I been hearing this shit since, like, I was in high school? 
that Christians were being oppressed. And it all goes down to this little fantasy that they have of rapture and tribulation and all that fun stuff. And can I mention something, Jeremy? Yes. Go ahead. Go I, ahead. yeah, I'm going to mention this YouTuber. I like him a lot. And I have, and while I disagree with him on a lot of things, I have mad respect for this guy. And his name is Pastor Bob Beeman. And uh, and I know this is weird coming from me, considering how many anti-Christian shit I have said in the first nine episodes of this podcast alone. But um, Pastor Bob Beeman is, in my opinion, this guy go. This guy is like the first pastor that I know, Christian pastor that I know on YouTube anyway, that actually goes into the tough questions that actually talks about the tough questions within the church and is not afraid to go down there. And that's where I have a lot of respect for the guy, other than the fact that he also downsized his house where he basically, <laughs> he basically went pretty, re uh, pretty uh, modern on his house by downsizing his house. To like I think a 500 square foot home or something. I digress. Um, he, he does, he's not afraid to uh, answer the tough, the tough questions and while I don't agree with a lot of what he says, I have mad respect for the guy. Do you know how many? Uh, do you know how many subscribers, Jeremy, that this guy has on YouTube right now? Well, more than us, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, more than us. Seven thousand three hundred and thirty-four, and considering that this guy's been around for at least four or five years, if not longer, that's not really a lot. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Meanwhile, and I've made fun of this guy during the uh, WrestleMania thing because of the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. The Vigilant Christian. Guess how many subscribers he has as of right now. Multiple, th multiple thousand, uh, significantly larger than, uh, yeah, significantly larger than the uh, other pastor. One hundred and ninety-seven thousand seventeen. And this new guy, Joshua Furistein, actually has almost as many as Pastor Bob Beeman at six thousand seven hundred and forty. Of course, the question is how many people are following him just to make the fun, just to make fun of him. The issue that I'm having is that there are these Christian YouTubers who feel this need to create shock value. A good example with the Vigilant Christian being that he ties fucking everything to the Illuminati, which is why I had to make fun of him during the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Which, and, by the way, is not something uh, that I, I have uh, not seen before. Uh, in my younger days, in a more uh, fundamentalist-oriented Christian church, uh, there were people who actually thought that uh, the New World Order was related to the One World Order, as in the uh, government of the Antichrist from the Tribulation which is literally seven years of hell on earth, which goes to show the kind of mindset these kind of people are in. Where, oh, oh, all the good people get to go up into he heaven, but then but then all the people who are left behind, they've got to go through seven years of literal hell on earth before Jesus comes in and kills all the people who still don't believe. So can someone answer the question as to why this guy has 30 times more views than Pastor Beeman does? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Yeah, I like I I would like to think that a lot of people just watch these kind of people so that they can point and laugh. Which, uh, if, if that's the reason uh, you're watching them, keep in mind they don't care that you're pointing and laughing at them. Any kind of attention that they get is good attention. In right, and I, I know, I, and I know, I'm bringing attention to this guy and Joshua Feuerstein as well. But I feel like this needs to be said because this is a very personal issue for me. Uh, Jeremy knows uh, full well, as well as a lot of my friends, that I make a very personal issue out of many political and religious things, dating back to my days as a political commentator, um, which was probably part of the reason why I left it for this podcast, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, 
y'all are gonna get my fresh take uh, right here on this. Uh, first of all, uh, if if this was clearly kind of some way of entrapment to have some kind of way where you could say, oh, where he could say, oh, this bakery is with us. They don't support gay marriage. Uh, they completely failed on account of the fact that these people have common sense. Uh, and on to the point that you were making about uh, regarding one's personal religious freedom. Yeah, Correct. I, I, I'm always a guy who's kind of like, I do not really care what you believe. I mean, in, in my lifetime, I've, I've been involved with people who are Christian. I've been involved with people who are more spiritualist. I've been involved with people who are atheist. And, and religion was never really been a sore spot because we're kind of like, you know, just don't be a dick about it. It's not, it's not so much being a dick as it is that stop being – stop accusing other people. I mentioned before that they should probably have a, like a positive message for some of their stuff. Um, yeah. Like I, I said, like I said it, it's, not, it's not because they're a conservative or a Christian that I dislike them. I dislike them because they're aggressive towards people who for the most part have a hard time defending themselves. And, and to that point. When you work in a certain industry, there is this thing you're supposed to do to keep contacts with people within that industry. It happens in every industry. It is not a negative thing by any means. It is not a sign of collusion in any industry or any means. But, you know, it happens in video gaming. It happens in journalism. You know, it happens in sports or, or any industry that you can name of. It's called networking. And right. you keep contacts within this industry in case, you know, you need to move on within that industry or or in case you need something that you cannot get yourself. I'm pretty certain that uh, in the cake baking industry, at least on the local level, networking happens. So if right. you are from one of these baking places that you're you are a Christian person who is not very comfortable with the idea of same-sex marriage instead of saying no screw you i'm not freaking doing this say i personally say something akin to this i personally do not feel comfortable uh serving same-sex mar marriage marriages with my cake baking services because of the kind of moral moral stances that I have. However, I do know places in this town who do and I can refer you to them. Another reason why I'm very like okay. Again, like I said, it's not that they're conservative or they're Christian. It is that they are aggressive towards people who, for the most part, cannot defend themselves, right? Right. And a good example of a conservative Christian who I have much respect for other than that of Pastor Bob Beeman. Uh, another, another thing about the guy is he looks like a, he looks like a rocker, by the way. He looks like a metal, <laughs> metal head. Um, well, a good example of, of a conservative Christian who really, in my opinion – shows that aura of goodwill towards people. Um, the late Johnny Cash. A lot of people know him as a great uh, country artist. He's also secondhandly known as a real defender of the poor. Uh, anyone ever listened to the song Man in Black would understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, and and also a lot of his songs do have uh, religious imagery from some of the uh, apocalyptic lore. Uh, yes. So and and unlike and unlike the songs of New Age Christianity, which they tend to get very shallow, they and all, they all sound the same. You know, oh love you God, oh love you Jesus. Yeah. Oh, you, you know, ba basically romance romance songs. For an ethereal being, right? Johnny Cash's uh, gospel songs—I would call them gospel songs anyway, or New Age Christian songs, whatever you call them—because they were made in the early two thousands. 
are of a very post-apocalyptic nature, are of a very dark uh, um, religious spiritual tone, and they're awesome. They are perfectly executed. They are well-made. And he talks straight from the heart. He talks real. And I feel like that if conservative Christians start talking, you know, more real rather than trying to be aggressive towards people who, you know, aggressive towards certain people, and they start bringing out a positive message saying, yeah, we might be against this and this and this, but we are also concerned about, you know, the poor. We're also concerned about, you know, some of the problems in this world that are not, you know, that are not Obama based, you know, instead of just instead of just feeling like a uh, a shill for the Republican Party all the damn time, which is what most of these guys are like. You know, if they did something like that, I think they could go a much longer way than if, you know, than if they did something like Joshua Furious in here. I just looked at another video from seven months ago, the $100,000 atheist challenge. Can you prove Joshua Furious wrong? And he breaks down in three minutes, apparently, why God exists. And it's like, that's a troll challenge. What What's your point? You know, is it to get clicks? That's seriously what you're trying to do? Yeah. Funny there, thing. There was that's... a more even-handed debate when Bill and I took on, took on, what was his name, Ken Ham? Yeah. It had two, it has 242,988 views. So obviously most of the people that are viewing his crap is not subscribing which I'm very thankful for. But, I don't know. This is just getting ridiculous yeah, to me. Really, sometimes the focus on the apocalyptic lore from the fundamentalist Christians really borders on, and I realize I'm making a very provocative statement by saying this, really borders on uh, torture porn fetish. <laughs> It's not it's not realistic by any it's not realistic by any means and I say I say it's not realistic in the sense not that I don't think that he's um wrong or right on his belief as to why a god exists it's that he knows that nobody's going to take his challenge because he's going because you never it's an old adage that I learned a long time ago. You never play another man's game. Joshua Furstein is the house, and he is trying to lure gambling atheists into gambling their reputation on something where he will try to beat them on a technicality. Yeah. Uh, to make a, to make a uh, quote from uh, Guys and Dolls, one of my favorite musicals, one of the only musicals I actually like, in fact... Uh, one of the char one of the characters' father gave him the advice: uh, if someone if someone ho holds up a jack card and says, "I'm going to bet you money that I can make this card jump up and spit cider into your your ear," don't take him up on it. Don't look at him. Don't acknowledge him. Just spit in his eye. Basically, if the bell, if 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 they try to do something outlandish like that, just don't even, don't do this necessarily literally, but flip them the metaphorical bird. Yeah. And as to another question that I was asked uh, during my rant of, will there be more of this in the future? I like to keep this to the absolute most egregious of things. Yeah. Um, I I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this on a regular basis. I certainly don't even want to try to do this on a monthly basis. I want to try to do this on – if there is something out there that is just so egregious that I absolutely have to say something, I'm going to do it. The only problem being – I told Jeremy this. This is the fifth anti-LGBT stunt done by born-again conservative Christians as a group this year. The bottom line is – you know, and there's a. By the way, I just found out on the MSN news there's a possible sixth one coming. Uh, yeah. Well, the bottom line is, conservative Christians, 
we're not trying to kill y'all off. You know, we we don't we don't want necessarily want you to die die perchance. What what we want is for you to have a little perspective. You know, a lot is made among Christian circles about and John, some empathy. God damn it! Yeah, a lot is made among Christian circles about the verse John three sixteen. You know, God for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not enough focus, and this is me going way back into my uh, days when I actually read the Bible on a regular ba basis. Not a lot is made about the follow-up verse that Jesus said. 3.17 For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You know how I feel about biblical verses, though. I, I feel like I feel like at least within the uh, most of the conservative Christian core, it's not even it's not even. Yeah, you know, it can it can always be taken out of context, but in, yeah, I, and, 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 and in this case, in this case, you know, the deletion of that seventeenth verse, or or the readdition of that seventeenth verse really yes. adds something that is direly missing. I think. Well, good example a few years ago um when I was in a when I was in a debate uh on my old blog The Halls of Neo Arcadia and Jeremy you were in on this one. Uh when I was talk uh this uh this one guy started talking about the parable of the talents. In Which by the way, you know what that parable is actually about? Money. It is literally a ta it is literally about money. A talent is a form of money. It is not metaphor for anything that you might possess that is considered a talent by modern definition. It is literally about money. For our listeners who don't who aren't very biblical or anything, because there I know we got plenty from Europe who probably have never even picked up a Bible in their lives. Uh, I'm just saying there's a lot of atheists and non religious people in Europe. Um, I'll I'll go over very briefly what the parable of talents is. So there's a father with three sons. Uh, old, uh, with the oldest son, he gives five talents. With the middle son, he gives two talents. And with the youngest son, he gives one talent. Now, the first two sons go out and do their wheeling and dealing. Um, and the third, and then they come back. And the first son says, um, here I brought you back, Father, ten talents, five talents plus the five talents that I made. The middle son comes back and says, here I brought you four talents, the two talents plus the two talents I made. And then to the youngest son, he asks, uh, what have you done with your talent? And he says, I dug it in a hole in the ground uh, in order to save it. And he, as a result, gave the one talent to the oldest son and banished his younger son. Um, and the guy that was commenting it, uh, basically said that the guy with five talents was the person who started a business. The guy with two talents was the person who invested in gold, silver, and food insurance, which was apparently a big thing at the time. Yes, food insurance. Look up the Glenn Beck stuff. And the guy with one talent was the guy who went to college. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, very uncomfortable for me and for a lot of people there. Um now, I was talking with a lot of religious people telling me that, I, that that actually has nothing to do with money. That has something to do more with uh, your spiritual uh, growth God than it is with money. Nevertheless, there are, a lot, there are a significant number of conservative Christians out there that actually believe that, mostly that of the Tea Party variety. Pretty much one and the same anyway. Well, even but, if, you, if even you consider the parable to be about money, uh, the elder two sons did something with the money that benefited not only them, but probably benefited other people. Right, and I, and that, that's the thing I think that... I, I don't think that conservative Christians really care. I mean, we talk, I mean they talk a lot about liberal Christians cherry-picking the Bible a lot. They cherry-pick the Bible, too. What? They, what, they don't eat shrimp? You know, they don't... Uh, you know, they don't divorce. They don't cheat on another person. They don't cheat with another person. I'm pretty sure they do. Oh, and, and another thing, too. Apparently in the Bible, it says that if you look at another person lustfully, you already cheated. Uh, you already have had sex with that person. So technically, if you're with somebody and you see someone else lustfully, you're already cheating on your wife or husband. 
Yeah, or, so, if, you're, or if you're with somebody, with somebody and you look at porn with them, you know, to get ideas for something that you might do together. When you're looking yeah. at those porn models, you've cheated with the porn models somehow. Not sure how that yeah. works. I shall work. I'm just saying, if we're going by like interpretation, so yeah, they're cherry picking too. So, so they can't. So I mean, and then the whole. I mean, we're not even talking about judge not lest ye be judged, and a bunch of other verses out there. Oh, oh, uh, I've got a story about that, and, and uh, let's make this the last thing before we move on. Really, I actually right, have ahead. a story about that verse. Go ahead. I was in college. The one year right. I was the one year I was in college because unfortunately my uh, college years did not go very my college year did not go very well. Uh, long story short, uh, some people party too hard. Hard I gamed too hard actually, uh, but <laughs> of, of course, you know you're you're at a college with you know young people who are exploring various things about life. So, of course, and uh, you're in that college in a Bible Belt city, uh, specifically Norman, Oklahoma. So, of course, street corner preachers. And there's this one guy who's just, you know, laying in to people for saying, this is a sin, and, you know, that's a sin. And this was a completely different person from the person I'm talking about right now. But there was a different preacher who actually suggested that masturbation was akin to homosexuality. I'm not even kidding. But Ooh. anyway, this first guy was going, you know, no, you, you're a sinner for doing this, and you're a sinner for doing this. And I, being the smart ass that I was, and also having a pretty good working knowledge of the Bible because of my upbringing, said, um, remind me if I, uh, I'm correct, didn't Jesus say, uh, judge not lest ye be judged? To which he immediately replied, he said that to hypocrites. And I'm like, uh, I'm going to go double check my Bible, but I'm pretty sure it was not prefaced by, and Jesus said directly to the hypocrites, judge not lest ye be judged. Did he just double down on stupidity? Yeah, pretty much. To close yeah, this. You know where that judge not lest ye be judged comes? It comes from the Sermon of the Mount. You know who were at the Sermon of the Mount? Five 5,000 men plus plus women and ch children who were really, really interested in hearing what this boy had to say, what this boy Jesus had to say. Not hypocrites. People who were interested. People who had heard about this guy who, who was preaching the Torah in a completely different way, which, by the way, yes, Jesus, devout Jew. Uh, and, you know, they, they were there in the middle of the day, some of them for, even forgot to bring lunch. They were so excited about this. You know, it's part of that long Sermon on the Mount that just goes about all different things, like blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, etc., etc., etc. That's what that's a part of. He wasn't talking to hypocrites. He was talking to people who were so interested in hearing what he had to say. Who, who were keen on hearing this new teaching of a new way of looking at the Torah. Nowhere does he stop and say, oh, by the way, you hypocrites, here's this for you. Well, to close the segment, I just wanted to say, just to summarize everything, that I guess, I guess what people were trying to tell me was that the entire point was that... Um, I, that Christians were being oppressed because the guy couldn't buy a cake that apparently said some negative comments. And what I'm trying to say is that no, it is not. And well, first off, no, it is not. And second off, please stop doing this shit because you are going to start driving everybody mad yeah. with absolute anger by doing so. And no, I understand that you guys may feel oppressed, but Considering that you guys, 19 times out of 20 that I see, are the aggressors in a political, in one of those political street fights, I like to call them, quote unquote, between conservatives and liberals, I would not call you oppressed by any means. Yeah. 
I, I have one last thing to say on this to Mr. Fer, Ferstein, Firestein, however it's pronounced. Firestein. You know, yeah. oh, so you can't get a cake that says we do not support gay marriage. You know what? I can't get a cake that says Kmart is a shitty place to work, and yet you don't see me crying about it. <laughs> Shots fired, baby. <laughs> But yeah, but, but yeah, basically that entire rant that I did was a hashtag shots fired. Speaking speaking of that last thing that I said, that's a perfect segue into our silly news and dumb tweets. Well, uh, well, I just want to say one more thing, Jeremy. Um, will there be more of these in the future? Like I said, I'm not going to try to make a habit of it. I I would like to keep these extremely rare. So, for those of you that are expecting another rant coming out of me, don't expect it in quite a while. So, uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and move on to the next segment, shall yeah, we? Let's let's end this with the silly stuff. Silly news, dumb tweets coming up next. Part of the reason why I said that toward the end of the uh, last segment was because it makes for a perfect segue to the first of our uh, silly news stories of the day. Um, I always knew Kmart was a shitty place to work. I just didn't know how literally. Oh, boy. Uh, From Racine, Wisconsin, by way of the Huffington Post. Melissa Jacobson accused of pooping in Wisconsin Kmart. <clears throat> a woman who returned to items to Kmart in Racine, Wisconsin, is accused of leaving something behind, not on her receipt. A big file, pile of her own poop. Melissa Jacobson, 49, was arrested on Monday after she allegedly snuck behind a store cash register and defecated in a box of security tags according to uh, the Journal Times. Security footage showed a woman, who authorities later identified as Jacobson, answering nature's call around 10.22 a.m. The footage also showed her reaching for paper towels beneath the counter when she was done. Then she went back to the customer service desk. Uh, According to the smoking gun, this is correlated from various different sources, Uh, Jacobson completed her return and exited the retailer. According to the footage, Jacobson was, get this, wearing a shirt with a dump truck on it and the phrase, dropping a load. (laughs) Oh my god. Perfect shirt is perfect. (laughs) By 12.50pm, employees started noticing the strange odor around the register. Gee, I wonder why. (laughs) And discovered the, quote, poo light special in the box. Okay, I approve of this pun for once. Which was also soaked with urine. (laughs) At that point, officers were called to the scene. Oh, man. One worker told investigators, and this was a phrase that had to be said, that Jacobson was a regular customer who should know where the public restrooms are located. (laughs) Another employee said that the suspect did not appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol or in any special need to go to the bathroom, according to the police complaint. Kmart employees gave officers Jacobson's address from the forms used when she returned merchandise. When they went to the house, they met a woman who identified herself as Melissa Jacobson, wearing the same pants, shoes, and aforementioned dropping a load t-shirt seen in the surveillance footage. Jacobson denied pooping in the Kmart, even though she was told about the footage. Officers said she resisted her their attempts to take her into a custody because you've already committed a misdemeanor. Why not commit? Why not commit a few more on top of that? She was charged with three misdemeanor con- charges of disorderly conduct, resisting an officer, and obstructing an officer, according to the Journal Times. Unfortunately, she is free on bond, $500 bond, because misdemeanor. Uh, She is scheduled for an April 30th pretrial conference, but the smoking gun also notes that part of her bond condition... Praise be to the universe for this! (laughs) ...requires her to have no contact with Kmart. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, let this be known. It is possible to get banned from Kmart. <laughs> it just takes you to have to be a really, really shitty person. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, not a great place to work at. There, there are some really, really terrible people, and 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 I've come across some fecal incidents uh, a few times myself. But this is a whole new level of, of pardon the pun, shitty behavior. And, and she was wearing. The t-shirt. She was wearing a t-shirt saying dropping a load. And she should have known. And she was a regular customer. So she knew that where the restrooms were. You know, I, I realize people will do some dumb shit in retail environments. No pun intended again. But. Uh... <laughs> they must have had a shitty time cleaning it up. <laughs> Well, enough of that bullshit. Let's move on to some bull semen. Oh, that, that's that's uh, much much different. <laughs> uh, from Leroy, Minnesota. Minnesota thieves steal seventy thousand dollars worth of bull semen. This is again from the Huffington how, Post. How? How do you even evaluate bull semen? I'll get to that. A farmer in Leroy, Minnesota, is probably having a ca- Okay, I have to take them to task for that pun. <laughs> After some ballsy thieves stole $70,000 worth of bull semen, again with the pun. <laughs> this is why I simultaneously love getting weird news stories from Huffington Post and regret getting news stories from Huffington Post. Uh... Here's the gist. A frozen canister about the size of a milk jug was stolen from an unlocked barn belonging to Daniel Wienus. Wienus? Wienus? I have no idea how to pronounce that last name. W-E-N-E-S-S. God, that sounds wrong. Last week. The canister contained a bunch of vials of bull semen valued between $300 to $1,500 each. The canister itself was worth $500, but when you add all the bull semen into it, that adds up to the $70,000. What the hell do they use bull semen for? Oh, oh, wait. Could that be used to, like, make, like, other, you mean, inseminate, like, accounts? Yeah, let, let, let me read through this. I'll get to the last paragraph, which explains yeah. it. Weenus wasn't sure what day the load was stolen, but said the only time he and his hired hand were away from the farm was on Easter Sunday. Mark May, deputy, chief deputy of the Mower County Sheriff's Office, that's a rural county if I ever heard it, says animal semen can be big business. I, and they put another pun in there, but I'm not going to justify it by repeating it. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, there is a market for this, he, uh, he is quoted. A lot of people bid on it or purchase it instead of transporting their animals to and from site, he, Mark May was uh, saying to uh, Valley News Live. They can purchase this vial of bull semen and inseminate their cow, and I guess it's just a more reliable way to do it. <laughs> so there's your answer. It is for artificial okay. insemination. Making sure. Uh, so, so far there are no suspects, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Someone's going to make a farm. You know, I, I, I kind I kind of feel like the bull's kind, the bull is kind of getting the raw end out of this because, I mean, yeah, they're getting, for lack of a better phrase, milked, <laughs> but they don't get a cut of the profits. Oh, what could a bull do with those profits? I mean, I, I guess maybe the profits go to more feed for the cow, so he, he would get a little bit of a cut from, a bit from that. But mm, yeah, <laughs> crazy stuff. And finally, uh, this one from News Nine dot com out of Oklahoma City. So this is from my neck of the woods. O 
Oklahoma City customers see nudity on restaurant TV during dinner. Uh, there's a place for sultry and steamy television, and usually it's after dark on a pay channel. So you could imagine the surprise of one customer at a local fast food restaurant when he saw nudity on the TV. Quote, strong sexual content, there was full nudity of both partners, said customer Gerald Whalen, about what was showing on the TV at the KFC near Santa Fe and Danforth last Thursday around 9.30 p.m. Whalen partially captured the steamy scene with his phone. It's already been viewed tens of thousands of times online. Quote, then the sound started and everyone in the whole place could absolutely hear it, said Whalen, who thought it was a pornographic movie. <laughs> you can see him laughing throughout the, the whole video of the incident. However, Whalen's wife wasn't laughing because the couple's six-year-old twins were also with them at the KFC. Mommy mode kicked in. I don't think they need to be seeing this, April Whalen remembered thinking. Turned out that the video playing was actually not an X-rated movie, but the Risqué's Stars Network show, Outlander. I'm really shocked that they actually had stars at KFC, April Whalen said. KFC ish released a statement on the incident. We apologize for any negative dining experience that may have occurred as a result of the restaurant's TV being changed without awareness or permission to a station showing inappropriate content. The restaurant said it will make sure certain channels can't be accessed again. Whalen just hopes nobody loses their job over the incident, although, as an editorial note from the Shadowbird, you know somebody got fired. I like how one of the first comments that she makes is, I didn't even know that KFC had stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't even put sh stars on the TV at, at Kmart. And, and, well, we used to not have a lot, all that much free reign. Although, uh, sometimes I have been known to sneak it onto the cooking channel. Uh, say when maybe Good Eats is on. <laughs> all, all, although, this last weekend, I did also get to see uh, two of cooking channel shows. Uh, Rev Run Sunday Dinners with uh, Rev Run, formerly of Run DMC. Oh. Uh, and uh, Dinner at Tiffany's, uh, which is stars uh, Tim Tiffany Amber Thiessen who used to be on Saved by the Bell, as uh, acting on other things as well. Uh, they're actually pretty good shows. Uh, but, yeah, we would never think to put it on, say, oh, Game of Thrones. You know? Yeah. As it is, as it is commonly referred to, Game of Boobs. Uh, <laughs> well, that's why it's so popular. <laughs> but, yeah... So, yeah, putting it on stars. I mean, to me, to me, it's quite an offensive thing to see some of these stations have it on Fox News. Putting it on stars is quite a different level of stupid. <sighs> well, I mean, it's bad enough that we got to listen to Glenn Beck while we're eating our fried chicken. But come on, man. You know, you don't, you don't want to see human breasts while eating chicken breasts, okay? Well, then why do they put Glenn Beck on the news? It's Fox News. What? Think about it. I know, but if we're talking about that we don't want to see breasts, why do you have to show Glenn Beck's boobs all over the place? Lord knows no one wants to see that crap. And, and I'm also not the only person who actually mentioned that because one of the Facebook commenters actually said, so you ate breast and watched breast at the same time. Yeah, classy. I mean, you're making the same joke as this asshole. Real classy. Come on. If you're making the same kind of jokes as me, come on, man. Uh, you do make some uh, pretty uh, out there jokes, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> all right. Bring, bring the pain, David. It's time for some well, dumb tweets. All righty, all righty. So, uh, so first one, Twitter creationists. You know how much I dislike them. To the point where they are actually one of the uh, white cards on our Cards Against Humanity deck on Cardcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cardcast.com. I don't know what the code was. U R P A X. Uh, Ur Urpax. U R P A X. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. If you play, like, if you play Cards Against Humanity, like on, say, uh, Pretend You're Zizzy or some of those other places that have Cardcast capability, go ahead. Put that in. 
Have fun. Laugh at our expense. <laughs> anyway, Twitter. Yeah, creationist. Anyway, first tweet comes from a resident Twitter Earth creationist. I can't believe it's been 2015 years since Jesus discovered America. So many levels of wrong. <laughs> so many levels of wrong there. Yep. For, for, uh, one, for one thing, uh, it has not been 2015 uh, years since uh, America was discovered, uh, depending on whether you go by the traditional lie that it was discovered by Columbus or whether you go all the way back to the Vikings, or hell, even if you go all the way back to the Clovis people who came across the Bering Strait land bridge. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Alright, and then uh, another one. Uh, this comment coming from... Uh, I, I can't tell uh, where this comment's coming from. It doesn't show any at, amp, you know, ampersand sign or anything. Or, amp, I'm sorry, uh, that at sign. You know, the at sign? Yeah. Uh, damn! The NFL been around longer than our government. We've had 48 Super Bowls and only 44 presidents. I didn't know that. Mm. There's this little thing called four-year terms. Some of, <laughs> some of which... Uh, some of those presidents have actually had multiple in a row. Like, say, FDR, who had three, well, two and a half. Uh... Um, I get about 95% of these uh, tweets from uh, this one particular uh, a Twitter, Twitter account called uh, Real Dumb Tweets. And uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this now is because this particular uh, tweet, they blacked out the name on this one. This person was so embarrassed, they blacked out his name. Yeah, when even the people whose job it is to do Twitter stupidity shaming decide that your name is not worth mentioning, I fear for the level of dumb on this one. <laughs> Whoever said the iOS 7 waterproofs your phone, fuck you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go w around uh, how wrong this is. First off, iOS. iOS. I operating system. As in software. As in not hardware. Yep. Second, uh, none of the iPhones have ever been waterproof unless you spend money on a very, very high quality case. And uh, three, what made you decide to test this feature that you thought this operating system update had? <laughs> And actually, I, I, sp speaking of test, silly tests of things, uh, I, I've lost the link to this, but there was this one YouTube video I saw. I, I wish I had saved the link for it. From uh, this group who does uh, experiments of a, kind of a looter nature. Uh, in this case, it was this lady who glued Mentos onto a bikini to uh, see what would happen if she... Uh, got into a bathtub with uh, Diet Coke in it. Of course, you know the Diet Coke and Mentos. You drop a Mentos in a bottle of Diet Coke and it creates this great big fountain. Unfortunately, uh, she did a few things to kind of uh, sabotage her experiment, and I don't think she ever realized uh, what she did here. First, uh, she didn't fully immerse herself in the Diet Coke. Uh, she only put in, she only put in like about maybe four liters worth. So she actually had to kind of awkwardly position herself to get the uh, bikini into the soda. Secondly, mm. uh, and this is the most important part, she dumped the soda into the bathtub. Now I know you're saying, okay, what was wrong with this? 
Well, if you consider this, and, and this comes from uh, remembering the episode of Mythbusters where they tested what actually contributes to this phenomenon, uh, mm -hmm. there are two major factors in what creates the Mentos Diet Coke jet. One of which is the fact that Mentos are not perfectly smooth. There's mm. like little tiny nicks in the candy shell that create size for bubbles to build up. Okay. The second major contributing factor is uh, the carbonation of the soda itself. Now, when you're in the bottle, it, it, it's in a contained space. Uh, for one thing, it's got the little kind of funneling action that cr actually creates the jet. And so she had it in a instead she had it in a bathtub where it's more and more spread out. Also, right. when you open up the bottle, yeah, there's that little fizzing of some of the carbon dioxide being released, but mm -hmm. not all of it escapes the soda. There's still a fair amount dissolved in there that fizzes up when you pour it into a glass. Well, when she poured it into the tub, a lot of that carbon dioxide escaped from <laughs> from solution. So, basically by doing that, she got rid of one of the major contributing factors to the fizzing, and, and she's laying in there and pouring the diet soda over herself in a way that I, I guess was supposed to be sexy, but it, it wasn't to me. Uh, just, just because I I don't find being covered in sticky, uh, fake sweetener laden liquid all that particularly sexy, but you, you know she's sitting there pouring it all over herself, wondering and you know putting herself down into it, wondering why it is not fizzing up the way that Mentos and Diet Coke are supposed to, and I'm looking at that and I'm like. Okay, so clearly somebody did not pay enough attention to the circumstances of the phenomenon. And just decided to do this because, ooh, sexy, you know, Mentos bikini, ooh. They, didn't, you know, they did not put enough thought into this experiment, and that is one of the worst things you can do when it comes to scientific experiments. You know what she needs? What? A dry ice air conditioner. <laughs> Uh, now, I did figure out, though, one way that she might have actually been able to get some kind of an effect. If she took a dip in, like, one of the holding tanks from a bottling plant. Okay. Because at that point, you know, the, the carbon dioxide would still be in solution. And you would still mm -hmm. have it in a relatively contained space, so maybe that huge fizzing action would have happened. Okay. Of course, you wouldn't necessarily have the great big jets because you don't have, like, basically the little nozzle effect of the uh, narrowing, tapering uh, bottle opening. <laughs> but you would have a greater fizzing effect then because you wouldn't have the carbon dioxide escaping into the air from being poured out. So, yeah, if you want to revisit this, with this experiment... Go get your local Coke bottling plant and see if they'll let you take a dip in their Diet Coke holding tanks. Odds are they probably won't, but if somehow you can manage to spring it, you'll probably find a lot more lively a reaction than this lady did. <laughs> Two more. Two more. Another, another uh, name read out this time. Uh, if you claim to be a feminist and you're not vegan... And you're absolutely confused on what the meaning of feminist is. Yeah, I've, uh, I've seen so. that retweeted. I've seen that retweeted by people who actually are feminists, and I consider myself to be one myself. The uh, logic behind this is that they think that feminism is about simply about challenging power structures, all power structures, including the one of human over animal. Whereas that is oh. not true at all. Feminism is about equality between all genders. Be it male, female, intergender, people who are transgendered, etc. It's not about it's not about just 
rar fight the power rar kind of thing break down power structures so you know veganism and feminism are not not related you are dumb your idea is terrible and you should feel terrible I don't mind if you if you are vegan either for health reasons or by per personal choice and of course if you're a feminist I'm very very happy with you because hey I I'm with you girls I'm with you girls but if you try to use any ideology uh, if you try to you know say uh, oh you absolutely have to be have to be die bye bye this you know if, if you're this thing you have to be this completely unrelated thing you know what you get from me a little thing i like to refer to as the binary 132 <laughs> yeah oh yeah you should tell about the binary 132 which is starting from the left thumb and moving to the right thumb zero zero one zero 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 one zero zero and yes the leading two zeros are necessary <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'll let you all figure out what that uh, brings out to. Yeah, figure it out with your. Hold out your ones, fingers. everyone. Hold out your ones. <laughs> yeah, and and finally, and, and finally, um, I, I'm just, I'm just going to, no. All right, this quote is just. <laughs> okay, hang on, hang on. All right. I only have sex at night because the sperm is asleep, which means I won't get pregnant and makes me a virgin. Hashtag smart. Honey, I got news for you. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to quote. I'm just going to quote here from Billy Madison. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I've ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this podcast is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Yeah, I, I got news for you, girl. In about nine months from that tweet, you are going to have a terrible surprise. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what, what, I'm a, this. a screaming, liquid covered surprise. <laughs> uh, assume, assuming you don't get an abortion. It's what I have to take care of for the next 18 years. Uh, assuming you don't get an abortion anyway. I mean, that's your choice. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> within about a few months, you are going to notice something very, very off with you. <laughs> oh, um, my God. Al also, uh, well, no, also uh, notions of virginity are bullshit, uh, but... Even if they weren't, I'm pretty sure you're not one. <laughs> and that's all we got for tonight, folks. Yes, because my sperm has to go to sleep now. <laughs> oh, oh my god! I'm, I'm, I'm just imagining sperm as a computer. You know, you, you know, like a laptop computer. You close the lid, and they go into sleep mode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, da, 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 well, da, da. I, I'm going to start making this a regular thing. I'm going to say my sperm is going to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, anyway, if, if you'd like to let us know what you thought about the show uh, and uh, help us idiot shame some of these people if you're so inclined. <laughs> if, if you've got your jokes that you want to make about this this stuff and you want to fire it at us, David, uh, let them know where all they can do that. <laughs> Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay, you can follow us on Twitter. I am at zero chr. <laughs> I'm Shadowbird seven twelve. Okay. Oh man, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash casualmo podcast. Follow us on Tumblr at casualmo podcast dot com. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Search casual mode, and we are also available on SoundCloud. SoundCloud dot com slash casual mode. On the FNX network at fnx.network and on iTunes on that gigantic ass uh, URL there. Or just go into the iTunes store and search casual mode under podcast and we should be right there. We've got all of our episodes uploaded. In fact, even including some stuff that I did 
with my big brother before the pilot on the last uh, college football, uh, the first college football playoff. Why did I throw that in there? Uh, because. And I will have uh, the next, uh, I'll try to put up some Let's Plays, hopefully uh, right after this show is uh, posted, is what I'm hoping on. And I should actually, from right after this recording, sometime on uh, sometime on Saturday, have up the Let's Plays. So uh, they will be up by the time this podcast is up. So go check out my Let's Play of Pokemon Crystal Kaizo. And- Lots of fun. And also, if you see at Albureo available on uh, STO, uh, Star Trek Online, uh, don't feel don't feel uh, afraid to say hi to me. Uh, I'll be there. I, I'll probably be, sweet. I'll probably have been there this weekend. So by the time you list, listened, if you saw at Albureo flying around Star Trek Online, oh, that's who that was. Until next time, I'm Jeremy, and I'm David. Wow. Later, y'all.